Hi, I'm Gleaves Whitney, and this is a continuation of my video essay, The Joy of the Liberal Arts in a Pandemic. Chapter 2, Working in the Most Extraordinary Laboratory of All, Human History. A study of history helps students grasp reality because it spreads before them the empirical record of what human beings have said, written, and done. Every experiment, every calculation, every invention, every discovery, every triumph, every failure that our ancestors recorded these past five years, thousand years, is there for examination and evaluation. From Adam to Adams, from Plato to Nato, from Stonehenge to Stonewall, it's all there, this rich human laboratory in our histories. Close study of those who have gone before equips students to think analogically and compare the way they think and live with the alternatives developed by earlier generations. We soon see, as Mark Twain observed, that history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. If you put our current war against the coronavirus in the long perspective of history, you quickly learn that we are not alone. Countless generations had to figure out ways to survive a plague. At one extreme is Eurasia during the Black Death the worst catastrophic event in history since it killed off half the Earth's population. At the other extreme is American Samoa during the Spanish flu outbreak of 1918-1919, probably the most successful place on Earth to survive a modern pandemic. In the current crisis, don't we want our leaders to know why that is? The study of history can give people much needed distance from present day concerns, and I don't mean by escaping them, but by becoming more objective. It used to be that historians wrote their books considering just one or maybe two viewpoints. But during the 19th century, public and private archives proliferated, as did the railroads and steamers that connected them, making it possible to research the same event from a variety of viewpoints. That's when history became a modern profession. The training of historians became methodologically pluralist, rigorously scientific, and liberally humanistic. It was now possible to see an event such as the Mexican War from a variety of viewpoints, from that of the soldiers who fought it, the generals who directed it, the slaves who supplied it, the Democrats who supported it, the Whigs who opposed it, the British who watched it, and the Mexicans who lost it. When pursued with an open mind, without ideological blinders, the study of history exposes our limitations and checks our balances. Like travel, it challenges us to embrace a bigger reality than the one we're comfortable with. I asked students to think about their lives in relation to those who came before. Who flourished better, I ask, you or they? You may like being modern, but what are the trade-offs to enjoying our lifestyle? Surveys reveal that our multitude of screens exhausts us. Social media leave us feeling envious and alienated from one another. The pollution generated by our lifestyle harms us. And what have we lost by gaining smartphones, 3D printers, and 5G networks? Did people in the past have it better in some ways? Did they have fewer distractions, less anxiety, more time to enjoy the rhythms of nature, more genial relationships with family, friends, neighbors? Because of modern medical and technological advances, there is a tendency to think that we today have it best. And in many ways we do. But students of history caution don't be so quick to judge. Historians learn to think comparatively and evaluate critically. They neither glorify the past nor idolize the present. As my graduate mentor, Stephen Tonser, used to say, the good old days were not that good and the present may hardly be better. When history is taught in the spirit of the liberal arts, it can be a, a potent antidote against the ideological poisons coursing through our body politic. Americans have recently been going through a great sorting. Extremists on the left have concentrated in the Democratic Party, extremists on the right in the Republican Party. This sorting has made principal accommodation more difficult, if not impossible, which in turn has been injurious to self-government. As James Madison asserted in the final paragraph of Federalist 55, self-government requires more of citizens than any other form of government. Our efforts to seek better ways to live with one another must be accompanied by the search for truth. Ideologues do not want truth, only power. To get it, they distort reality by lazily resorting to prepackaged answers. Modern day sophists, these ideologues are like people seeing all of life through colored glasses when what they really need are clear lenses. 
This concludes chapter two of my video essay, The Joy of the Liberal Arts in a Pandemic. I invite you to watch chapter three. Thanks for dropping in.